right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning into the podcast today. This show is brought to you by the back-to-back national champion Yukon Huskies, bitch. Let's go! Oh my god. All right, now that my yelling has turned off half our fan base. Um wow. I mean, okay, first of all, thank you guys for tuning back in. We took a little week off there and today is not the normal day of our show. We normally are live on Tuesdays, but uh we are we are a little off track here because of the off season, but we'll get back on track soon, I promise. So thank you guys for tuning in. Uh we've got a lot to go over here, but first and foremost, <laughs> the back-to-back national champion Yukon Huskies. We have done it again. I mean, Pat, it was We'll we'll get into it here in a second, um, but like it, just a crazy season. It honestly had this sense of inevitability to it that even like the commentators were talking about. Like this team looked so dominant all year long, and I think as fans, we're kind of waiting for the pin to drop at some point, like for some level of adversity, right? For something to happen, and maybe it's just the pessimist in me. But like I was like, it can't just be this easy the whole way, right? And it 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 kind of was. That that's how good this team was, right? You know, I. I, I was watching the game with my dad, and not only did I say during the game, I said after the game, I said there was never a second in this game that I thought they were going to lose. I mean, I think mm-hmm. the the the, mo- the latest in the game they trailed was like twenty five twenty two or something, and even then there was no doubt. Was I nervous yeah. as hell going into the game? Absolutely, sure, absolutely. Course. But once they were h- hanging with Purdue, I knew there was there was no way. And I also said too, I said to my dad, I said, was there any point the season where you didn't think this team would win the championship? And the answer is no. No. Even after the Seton no. Hall loss in a not great win against St. John's, even with some ugly games in the Big East tournament, even when Creighton shot the lights out against them, there was never a second this year after where I thought they were not going to win the championship. No, 100% with you. Um, we'll get back deep into UConn here in a second, but just to give you guys a preview of what today's show has to offer, obviously going over the UConn repeat and, uh, you know, Purdue maybe a little slander fest on Zach Eady here as get our ready. Pat has, has pre- procured for the show. Um, WrestleMania, that's where I was this weekend, so I'll give you a little recap on that weekend. Uh, my sixth WrestleMania now, uh, whatever, I don't know how many in a row because the COVID broke one up because we didn't, obviously, no fans went to that one. But been been to every WrestleMania since WrestleMania 35, so I'll give you guys a recap on how that weekend went for me and the state of WWE as a whole. Uh, Pat, short, like, what was this, two days after our last show? Was that when Diggs got traded? or what was the, it? What I, the I think, hell? yeah, Stefan Diggs, Stefan Diggs got traded. Um, it was kind of a last uh, last little ditch thing here before I actually left for WrestleMania. So I was able to make a video on that at least, which was cool. Uh, but yeah, very out of nowhere, we'll talk about the repercussions of Stefan Diggs ending up in Houston for <laughs> honestly not that big of a return as we'll talk about. And then some other NFL news and notes as well. And Pat, we've got our draft pick priority for yes, our fantasy do. football draft. <laughs> now this is something that it's it, it varies so much year to year. Like because we pick a different way to determine our fantasy football draft order every year, and it it honestly varies so much with how close those events are to the season. Like we've done last year, what was was last year MLB Home Run Derby? I mean, either way, yes, we've was. done we've done that in the past, and that's obviously not happening for what two months. So this is one of the earlier years. We just happened to decide let's and, do it with the NIT bracket pool. <laughs> so we we all filled out NIT brackets, and uh, we'll tell you guys a little bit about that probably toward the end of the show where we've ended up in our uh, in our fantasy. Draft. So uh, that'll hint, be an exciting. I'm very sure. happy. Yeah, Pat is uh, Pat picked Seton Hall to win the whole thing. So uh, we'll we'll let you guys know where that ended up being. Let me. I'm just jotting, jotting this down so I don't forget to talk about it at the end of the show. Fantasy football draft order. But Pat, let's get into it. Um, I guess I should I should hit this you know real quick. Good evening. I'm Ron Burgundy, and this is what's happening in your world tonight. And again, what's happening in your world tonight is UConn wins the title again. So UConn's path to this championship, Pat, if there were any haters out there, which there there are, there were, um, about UConn's Still path are. to a championship last year, um, I, I think anyone with any sort of reasonable brain that kind of has to be 
you know, uh, vindicated at this point because UConn, regardless of even the path, you know, up to Purdue, beat the second best team in the country, which is the Purdue Boilermakers. I mean, you could make an argument for Houston with a healthy Jamal Shedd, but no, either way, the, the way they dominated Purdue, um, this was inevitable regardless of the path. But look, beat Illinois, Alabama, and Purdue since the last time we spoke here and won every game by double digits, had the highest point differential in tournament history. So there is an argument to be made that this was the most dominant tournament team in NCAA history. Um, and Pat, to me, this this was my main takeaway from watching this team in the tournament and this whole season, is when you watch UConn, it's it's weird because it's like you almost think to yourself, like, well, why doesn't every team play this way? Because it's it's not that UConn is more talented than any other team in the country. Yes, they have the one big difference to a lot of teams, which is Donovan Klingon. Of course, not every team has a 7-2 future lottery pick who's mobile and just impacts the game so much on both ends of the court. But when you watch how... Edie Clear. Edie uh, Clear. When you watch how well they move the ball and the decision-making and just how smart they are on defense and how well they play as a unit, it... It's it's just an air of like there's no mistakes. And so you watch them and you're like, well, why can't other teams do this? And it's simply to me a matter of a coach establishing this insane culture that he's built up now over the last six seasons yeah. since he got hired and bringing in players to buy into that system. Because, you know, no matter how much another team and any other program, which I'm sure they do want to replicate this, no matter how much they want to replicate this, you have to have every player buy in to do something like this. And I think for Hurley to be able to bring in guys that do that, you know, especially a guy like Stefan Castle, like for him to identify Castle, who by all accounts, you know, was eventually going to be a lottery pick, whether it was after this season or later, to, to get a guy like him who's likely to be one and done. And he buys into his role this year where he's just, you know, the guy who's going to lock up your best player on defense and he's going to make the right play on offense. And he's not he's not a guy with a, a huge bag offensively yet, at least not shooting wise, but for him to be such a great fit on this team. It was just, it's just a testament to Hurley and what he's built because watching and, this team, it's like, I, it's, it's really fascinating just to see, see it all and, year. And for Hurley to be able to pull a top 10 five-star recruit from Georgia to, to bring him yeah. to UConn. And it was a point, could you imagine if Castle went to Georgia, for example, or Georgia Tech, he might be the number one overall pick. Yeah. Like if he had an opportunity to rate. be the guy offensively where, you know, where, where teams could truly see what he has because a lot of his merit now is on potential. Mm -hmm. And I think it's absolutely fair. I think it's absolutely justified. I think he is going to be a, a sure thing top 10 pick. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so. Like, there was lots of talk about Andre Jackson last year. He's basically Andre Jackson, but 10 times better. Yeah. Just the athleticism, the shot, he's got a better shot than him. And, and it's true that, like, the culture... Well, one thing I do want to pump the brakes on that I've heard so much is like, oh, my God, Hurley lost three starters from a national championship team. Oh, my goodness. Like, yes. But they had the guys that, like... Losing Sonogo? Donovan Klingon is better than Sonogo. He's just a... is a better player than Sonogo. And... But just to have him on the bench there and then to bring in a top 10 recruit... And then to go get a sharpshooter, it's like, I don't think he's like, oh my God, he made nothing, out, something out of nothing. No, he didn't. No, he did not. Like, but, but what you said about the culture is 100% true because every single player, I mean, granted all seven, there are really seven guys mm -hmm. in the rotation had a specific role on that team. Yeah. And in certain games, that roles, the roles were more important. Like in this game, we saw Tristan Newton. It was a Tristan Newton game. There were Donovan Klingon games. There were Cam Spencer games. Not enough Alex Caravan games for my liking. And there were even a couple Steph Castle games. The Alabama game was a Stephon Castle game. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that they were that deep without being deep at all. With only running yeah. seven deep, but yet being so deep in terms of how many ways they can beat you. Just so unbelievably impressive. And... Yeah. The fact that Tristan Newton, you know, a kid that they were playing in the American uh, at East Carolina is now in the is in the Huskies Ring of Honor or whatever, yeah. whatever they call that. The Ring of Honor, the Huskies, Huskies of Honor. Yeah. <clears throat> the fact that he's there is is truly remarkable. Yeah. And I, I will say, you know, you mentioned Hurley losing the three starters. Like, yeah, he was able to replace them with, you know, more than viable players. But to me, that's also like a testament to him and the confidence and that he has in the players that he brought in. Like, you know, 
yes, I think it's it's crazy now to say that Klingon, as an overall player, might have been a better player starting center than Sonogo, just because of the contributions on the defensive end, even though Sonogo's post game was a just a thing of beauty, and I miss well, him. I mean, he's what, five but, inches, four or five inches taller yeah, than him, too. Yeah, so, so like, uh, overall impact-wise, yes, I think Klingon was certainly a more impactful player, but for him to for him to make the loss of Jordan Hawkins feel non-existent because he yeah. went and got this dude from Rutgers slash Loyola, Maryland, and he just becomes basically Jordan Hawkins just without as much NBA upside. Um, and then to get Stefan Castle, who is, you know, plays like Andre Jackson, just in a less flashier way. And with honestly a, a better looking jumper that was a little more reliable at times. Um, just, just the talent identification and the fit identification that he was able to pull to put this roster together. And, you know, not just to make it as good as last year, but to make it honestly a lot better than last year like last year's team peaked in the tourney and so yes. I think we remember that version of the team and them being basically as good as this team was or you know around the same talent level um but this team was incredible all year long and I mean there were, they left very little doubt as to what was going to happen this year and I, I think the other thing is two huge guys on this team were Hassan Diara and Samson Johnson yes like Hassan Diara could have transferred he could have easily transferred and went and played somewhere and started. But no, he bought into it. I mean, granted, his brother's on the coaching staff. His brother mm. played, well, I don't know if he even played much at all, but his brother he did. was he once. He played a decent amount before his, he His got brother hurt. was once a player on UConn. So like, yep. But the fact that he stayed and bought in and said, I'm going to be the sixth man. I'm going to be the spark plug. He was huge in yeah. so many games. He was. The fact that he improved his three-point shot so drastically. He's a great passer, and he is not afraid to attack the rim being, what, six foot? I think he's six even. Like, uh, he's, yeah, if, yeah, he is not. He is not a big guy. Just the confidence, just the spark. And then Samson Johnson. He started the first game of the year last year over, um, not Caravan, because Caravan was hurt. Over somebody. Oh, no, Jackson was hurt. He started the first game mm -hmm. um, over Caravan. And then he got hurt, he broke his foot, and he came back, and he didn't see the court at all. Yeah. That seems like an immediate transfer, but no. He said, no, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to be the backup big. And the fact that he was so different from Klingon. Yeah. And the fact that he could run the floor. You see Draymond Green tweet about him? I did. I did. I but, thought that was cool. While as much I don't as Draymond's think all, a goon. But. While I don't think all of what he said is true, I don't think Edie necessarily gave up. But the fact that Johnson made that guy run. Yeah. Johnson made that guy run, and to have those two huge slams in a row, and everyone's like, oh, he didn't do shit, he played five minutes. Exactly. The yeah. fact that he did what he did in five minutes. But for him to buy into that, and I truly hope that he comes back again, because granted, I don't think he's a starter. Like, I don't mm. think he's, like, a core piece of the team. But I think he could come off the bench and be a really strong player, and it just depends, mm. does he want to do that again? I, I truly hope he does. Hassan Diara has another year as well. Um, mm -hmm. And senior day, they asked him, he goes, oh, I haven't really thought about that. It's like, oh, yeah, I haven't yeah, really right. thought about uh -huh. that. I truly hope he comes back. And um, well, another thing that I kind of thought about when they played St. John's, Naheem Aline should have stayed. He didn't. He would have played more on UConn. Then he would. He did. He played like ten minutes a game. It was. It was absolutely in in hindsight in Naheem Aline's best interest to stay at UConn. I don't think it was in UConn's best interest to keep Naheem Aline around. But I think he would have been a really nice eighth player in that rotation. He would have sure. offered. He would have offered something off the bench that Diara and Johnson inherently couldn't in his three point shooting, which got good at the end of the year. I, I just during that St. John's game, I'm looking. I'm like, I haven't seen this guy. I've barely seen this guy at all. And I, yeah. I just wish he was still, like, I think he would have made this team, I think he would have fit right in. But, yeah, I understand at, at, in the moment why, you know, people always say, like, oh, they transferred, they betrayed. And it's like, they get told what's going to happen. Yeah, like, yeah. I saw a lot of Josh Carlton slander because everyone's like, oh, these are the guys that built the team. And nobody mentioned Josh Carlton. They're like, oh, he left for Houston because he was gonna, not going to have a role. Like, these players get told by the coaches straight up, like, hey, like, you can stay. You're not going to play much. Of course yeah. you're going to leave. Of course you're going to leave. And I'm sorry. Josh Carlton was one of the least enjoyable players to watch in UConn history. And he was he was able to put it together more in Houston because I think they were able to utilize his skill yeah. set better. And he absolutely played better at, at Houston. But 
Man, I hated that guy while he was at UConn. <laughs> I really did. He was just it, the dude could not jump over a phone book. I mean, he was me if you added a foot to his height. Like I, it was it was rough. But no, I let, Pat. Let, let's but get my, into. Yeah, my point is, is that yeah, go, people, go ahead. People transfer for a reason. Like people don't just say like, "Oh, fuck this, I'm out of here." Like the writing is on the wall, and yeah, definitely. Obviously, we'll talk about their future next year, and we'll see. Hopefully, that a lot of these freshmen that did not see the floor stick mm. around and we'll see what yeah. they can offer but we'll talk about that absolutely uh, let's get into the game itself against Purdue because I mean look this was the game that I think college basketball fans if you really wanted the best game possible this is what we were looking forward to at least after Jamal Shedd got hurt because it was really any it was UConn versus Houston or UConn versus Purdue that's what you wanted if you yeah. wanted the best game possible in the national championship game and honestly matchup wise I think we got the ideal one because everyone wanted to know what would happen Klingon versus Edie well we got the game um I, I want to say this Props to Purdue for getting this far. I mean, I, I'm not, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to write off Purdue automatically anymore going forward. Just because, like, I really do think it's a mental hurdle for the team. Even when you have players that may not have been the ones that choked in previous tournaments, like, there's still that you're going to tense up if you're Looking losing Kentucky. to a lower seed yeah. in an early game. Like, I think now they've got that monkey off their back a little bit. So shout out to Purdue for finally getting this far. Um, and, and look, any other year, they very well may have won it all, but this UConn team was just different. Like, it, it takes a special, special team to be able to game plan and say, look, we know Zach Eady's great. We're going to kind of just let him work one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to let Klingon do what he can do, which in fairness was not a lot. I mean, Klingon, I thought, Klingon, I thought made it tough on Edie, but Edie was still making those tough shots. Like it was, it was a good battle over there for sure. But I think Edie was still scoring almost at will, even though the shots were tough, but it takes a special team to be able to say, look, we're going to let you do that. We're going to cut off everything else. Like this team, this Purdue team, you know, took four years to do it, but they finally built a team that had a bunch of three-point shooters around Zach Eady. So, you know, when guys collapse on Eady, those guys can make you pay from outside. UConn basically said, we are not letting you do that three-point shooting bullshit. We are going to just lock that down and look... Maybe your guards beat us in the mid-range, maybe whatever. That's how we're going to lose this game if we're going to lose this game. But we're going to take away your your big, or at least second biggest strength after, you know, ED on the inside. And uh, easier said than done to be able to pull off a game plan like that because no other team really was able to do that against Purdue this year, not on a reliable basis. And it was fascinating to watch. And, I mean, just, just what a performance by UConn overall. Seven three-pointers. Purdue a took attempted. Yeah. seven three-pointers. A great three-point shooting team. That is insane. The lockdown. And when Johnson came in, you know, they started doubling 80 a little bit. But mm. I, I said to my dad, I'm like, these guys are quick enough to get back. Yeah. And you saw Cam guys Spencer like Diara and Newton and Spencer and, um, and uh, Castle. They were able to get back to the perimeter. Like, even when they're double teaming and he looks out. They had a guy right in their face. Oh, yeah. Uh, pause. Um, Ao and Ao. Alex Caraban was fantastic defensively as well. He he offensively, I don't think he scored in the first half, but he hit some. He had that big three in in the second half, but he did a tremendous job defensively. Yeah, and apparently it was Luke Murray, Bill Murray's son, yep. who um drew up that game plan. He was the Purdue scout, and he said, "This is how you beat this team." Kudos to him, and. Yep. Not only, like, you can think that. You can say, like, oh, yeah, this is how we beat them. But if you don't have what it takes to do it, to execute, I, look, then it's all just a thought. But not yeah. only did they have the right game plan, they had the right players to execute said game plan. It was perfect. It's one thing if you have a, a roster like Purdue and you've got, you know, one three-point shooter or maybe two. They had three guys in their starting lineup outside of Edie that can rain them on you. And for UConn to just be like, yeah, we're going to take them all out of the game. Like, you shouldn't just be able to do that. So I think that was what was so impressive to me about their effort and just how that game went. Um, a wildly <laughs> successful team. Wild, wild game yeah. to watch. And... I, I guess really the the main point that we have not talked about here, um, the the seven foot four elephant in the room, uh -huh. and I'd like to preface this with this: Zach Eady had a phenomenal career. He won two Player of the Years, and both of them were warranted. He was the best player in the country two years. He is a phenomenal passer. Again, like you said, he scores at will. Like some of these shots, it's just like. It's not like he's just dunking and making layups. You know, he's mm. a couple feet from the basket. You know, these yeah, are... He's got good touch, You know, you've sure. got to make these shots still, which... 
and he did it. And he played well. But I see everyone saying, oh, Edie, 37 points on Klingon's Dome. Uh. Okay. I'm like, okay. How ma- First of all, how many of those points occurred when the game was over? Mm. <clears throat> how many of those points occurred when Donovan Klingon had four fouls and was literally backing up as he went to dunk? Yeah. Or how many of those was when he was being guarded by six foot eight Alex Caravan had a literal eight foot, eight foot, oh word, eight, eight inch foot. advantage mm. over him. So like he played a good game. The stats are so inflated. <clears throat> but the thing that I noticed mainly, you kind of 14 offensive rebounds. He is seven foot four. And I understand a lot of them were more loose balls off th- mm-hmm. things like that. But for his size, he is not as good of a rebounder as he should be. And so many times he got duped by the lob. Like on those two Johnson lobs, for so some reason, he would just go after the guard. Yeah. And you've got either Klingon or Johnson just wide open for the lob. So many times, like defensively, I just don't think he's nearly as aggressive as he should be. He's got a natural gift. You don't teach height as all the old boomer basketball mm. people say you can't teach height he's got that he could be an elite defender and he's not a bad and he's not a bad defender but he could be so much better he could be so much more aggressive um as i tweeted if he was six foot ten he'd be washing cars like <laughs> yeah <clears throat> someone would put it in the chat put six five no six ten like i will go to that point he is better taco fall like yeah. like no i think like, that's fair i, I don't want to say because taco falls is bad like <laughs> taco yeah. falls is flat out bad taco at fall basketball is bad. zach Eady is not bad at basketball no. but his height is 75 percent of the reason why he's a good basketball player and everyone's talking about how oh, Edie owns Klingon. well one let's see where they both get drafted yeah. i understand that Edie's two years older i think maybe three than than Klingon. But more importantly, in five years, let's see where they're both playing. Like when, when Zach Eady is on the Guangdong Tigers, Niho, Niho, <laughs> and Klingon is on the Pelicans. Who knows? That's where I want him to go, by I the way. I hope so. But, go play with Hawkins. But, I'd love that. Uh, he, well, he won't play with Hawkins. Hawkins will watch him play. But, um, oh, all right. But um, <laughs> we'll see in five years. Like Eady won the night, so to say. But like, like we said, yeah. they went into that game saying, this one guy cannot beat us. Well, yeah. He'd have to score 80 points to beat us. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. So they basically let him. Well, you know, he still yeah. has to execute. He still has to make all these shots again. I don't no, want to sure. take I don't want to take everything away from him. But they were okay with him popping the fuck off. Because they knew that he yeah. was going to do that. He was at least going to score yeah. 20 points. So... You know, I, during the game, and the, oh, God, the other thing. You know me. I Like, I'm a baseball umpire. I kind of, you know, am an apologist to officials a lot. The way that he gets officiated oh, is mind-boggling. It like, hurts I am, me. I, I, nothing pisses me off more when people are like, oh, the, re- you know, the, the refs do this. Oh, the fix was in. Oh, these refs are mm. awful complaining about yeah. everything. His signature move. The shoulder turn is a foul. Like, that is a foul. Like, (laughs) there were, I've never, I couldn't tell you the last time, like, I've watched a game and was just, like, yelling at the TV, like, that's a foul. That's a foul. The screen where Castle fell down was not a foul. Like, uh, her, that was, Mm. that was correctly called is, is not, is not an illegal screen, but his signature move is a foul. Like, and uh, on defense, too, so many times. I just couldn't get over how much like he got away with. I, you know, I don't know if it's conscious by the officials, you know, I'm not, I've never wanted to be like, Oh, it's rigged there and make it. But like, just the way he plays just puts these officials in a trance where like they weren't calling stuff. And, but, but again, he, he has earned a lot of the flowers he gets He'll probably get drafted in the top 20, maybe, maybe, oh God, he shouldn't go in the we'll lottery, see. but like maybe guy, right out, yeah. right outside the lottery, but I do not expect him to have 
much of an NBA career. Like he's like big Jimmer for dad is the way I see it. Yeah. Like a complete like revolutionary college basketball player that may not cut it in, but if he goes somewhere else overseas, he'll dominate. Oh, I'm he can sure dominate. I'm... I'm sure he'll. And I think he's there. the kind of player to go and do that rather than yeah. ride the back of NBA benches potentially for ten years and say you yeah. did that. We'll we'll see we'll see if he goes the Boban path or not. But yeah, when people talk about Ed owns Klingon, it's like that is where we need to talk about basketball is a team game. Um, yeah, if you're gonna have a one on one post up and one guy is seven four with good touch and the other one is seven two, you know, only quote unquote seven two, like, yeah, the seven four guy's probably gonna score a lot on that guy with no defensive help. That's not what the NBA is. They are not going to allow Edie to get these one on one post ups ever. And NBA teams, almost all of them have power forwards who are gonna have, you know, come over to help on defense that are much bigger than and much stronger and more athletic than a guy like Alex Caravan or any other power forward that Edie probably had to deal with help defense from all year. Like it's the NBA is just such a different game. Edie, you know, again, played a great game. I don't want to shit on him completely, but like he's slow on his feet. He's not an overly skilled guy. I, yeah, I think he's going to be a second half of the first round sort of pick, and I expect whatever team makes that pick to regret it in about a year because this is a he is a project. At, at the bare minimum, he needs to be able to shoot the three soon because that that you just you need to be able to stretch the floor unless you are literally a generational defensive player like Rudy Gobert. To he is fair, not that. To be fair, he claims he can shoot threes. As, as Donovan well Klingon does as well. Yeah. But both of them have said, they don't let me. Mm-hmm. Klingon actually took one in the championship game. I, I, I wanted saw that. that. I didn't want anything to go in more than that shot. But So, like, he says, oh, I can shoot threes, but th- why would I do that? And we'll see. Even, you know, we, even we, then. We'll see if that's the case. Because if he can shoot threes at seven, at seven foot four, God bless. Like, we're all, even, I'll, yeah. I'll say I was wrong. And I that mean, kid will play in the league for a long time. Look, even then, it's like if he's able to shoot, what does he become? Like, late career. I'm. What comes to mind is late career DeMarcus Cousins, who was a bench center because he could not move anymore because of the injury. But he right, could still was- shoot a little, and he was a big presence down low. And he is now out of the league doing whatever the hell, and he's not that old yet. But the injury, the injury, I think, turned him into the speed that basically Zach Eadie's at right now. So I don't think I don't think Eadie's going to work out in the league. Um, Klingon... Like, I, Klingon's certainly an, an interesting NBA prospect. I don't think he is a complete slam dunk either, but ha- definitely has more of the traits that you want in an NBA-type center because uh, he can move. <laughs> and, and this draft he, is, he can move. And this draft is full of role players. Like, I don't think... This is a weak draft. This I is a weak draft. I don't think we're going to look back, and um, it's very reminiscent of, like, Anthony Edwards' draft, where it was mm. kind of like, who the hell are a lot of these guys? And Yeah, we're looking at an international Edwards guy going is fantastic first, probably. And, Lamella Ball made an all-star team, but yeah, this is just going to be a lot of role players. I don't think we're going to be looking back in three or four years and being like, wow, there is a star from this draft. And that's why Klingon's going so high as well as Stefan Castle. But I think, again, the fact Klingon moves great for being 7'2", and he got a lot stronger, and he's got a great presence on defense. I mean, I think another thing I was going to say about Edie, like, yeah, Edie dominates. Can you imagine Bam Adebayo or Anthony Davis or Rudy Gobert? covering him yeah it's a whole different animal from right. you know a six foot 11 guy who will be selling car insurance in three weeks <laughs> like it's a tall car insurance salesman man like that like that's the thing like i i think clinging at least in you know again the claim to shoot but he's he's younger he's more athletic i understand why yeah clinging like obviously Edie had a much better college career in the, the last two years where they were both really relevant. Edie had a much better career, but I think it is plain to see why Klingon is going to go a reasonable amount of spots ahead of him. Yeah, certainly. Um, and, and look, that draft is kind of what's up next for as far as us following our, our UConn guys and seeing what's in their future. But the question is, what is next for UConn overall now that this championship is in the rear view, rear view mirror or I guess current view mirror? Um, Pat, I think top of our minds even going into the championship game was, uh-oh, could Dan Hurley leave for the now vacant job at the University of Kentucky? Um, credit to Dan Hurley. He has essentially all but shut those rumors down at every chance he's gotten. And yeah. But he hasn't I, just outright said no. 
Well, like he it said, was, like, it, oh, I'll talk thing. to my wife, and he was on the herd today, and he was saying, like, oh, you know, we've done something great up here. He never just outright has said, no, I'm not going. It, he's it very much be, implied it, but still, like, he's he's scary. It me. would be it would be bad negotiating to outright say no because I of think course, at the, of course I think at the very least he's going to leverage this into a slight raise at UConn, which he has earned regardless. <laughs> he just went back to back. I think he would have gotten that regardless of the Kentucky um, job being available. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, look at, at every turn. He he has not really uh, given Kentucky fans much hope, I don't think, unless you're you're really looking for just the fact that he hasn't said outright no. But he's saying, look, UConn's where I'm happy. All I'm thinking about is the three-peat. So I'm not particularly worried about that. Um, John Calipari is heading over to Arkansas, which was just, I mean, Pat, we talked a couple weeks ago about should Kentucky move on from him, and we I at least said yes, um, just because like he's just not really built for the current landscape of college basketball anymore with the one and duns and all that. But <laughs> You know, may and, and he's still the same guy. He's still the same coach, right? He's going to Arkansas now to just kind of uh, implement those philosophies. But maybe he maybe he switches some things up. Maybe be, maybe he's more motivated to you know put some respect back on his name. Maybe he's going to change tactics a little bit. At the very least, he's definitely going to raise you know Arkansas stock here a little bit. Um, but back to UConn. Seems like Hurley's sticking around. The rest of the coaching staff is sticking around, which I thought that was huge. The fact that uh, Luke Murray and Kamani Young are both running it back, which is awesome to hear. I think it's at the point where, say, the 2%, I'll put it at a 2% chance Hurley leaves. I think they would just promote one of them. I, I, I think, think Luke so Murray and yeah. Kamani Young are both future head coaches. So I think if you want that continuity, I, I think yeah. that would be, because like, where else would they really go? Like Steve Peichel? Uh, obviously, he's a UConn yeah. guy at Rutgers now. Like, yeah, Steve, I'd rather Pikeel, like, I'd rather just run Shaheen it with Luke Holloway. Like, where where would I? I don't. That's what I mean. Like, there's not like this obvious kind of candidate here. <clears throat> so, but yeah, yeah, that that's huge. And I saw like a lot of people like, oh, way too like John Rothstein, way too early top ten. And people were like, out of their minds that UConn wasn't in the top ten. It's like, no shit, UConn's not in the top ten. Like right now, out of their rotation players this year. There are only two players that are like definitely coming back or seemingly yeah. in Caravan and Samson Johnson. I, I don't even think Caravan's a definite. Oh, I think seeming. he is. I, I think I, he is. I don't, I think whatever his stock was, I don't think his stock plummeted, but like he was like yeah. a second round pick at best and he did not have a great second half of the year. And that's, I think he could come true. back and be, you know, the number two guy. Like he could be a huge part of this team next year. So I. I would be really surprised. It would be a mistake. Like, he's going to put yeah. his name in and, you know, get the feedback. But I would be really, really surprised if he was not, um, if he was not back. And so, like, of course, of course, like, UConn is not in people's top tens. They shouldn't mm. be yet. Yeah, it, they, I mean, they they shouldn't be, and yet Vegas, <laughs> the odds for a, a national champion next year, UConn is still in the top three, uh, pretty much everywhere you look. I mean, look, people like Rothstein and these teams putting out, or these these reporters putting out like projections next year. Yeah, you can't really project anything with UConn, but in terms of just odds to win a title and just hoping things fall into place, uh, I guess these these sports books are just saying, look, they'll figure it out, which I I think is fair at this point. I because, mean, we'll do something because you know that he's going to be active. Like, for example, Brendan Housen from Villanova yes. yep. entered the portal today, and Hurley complimented him. He said something very complimentary of him after they played in February. He's liking UConn tweets. I don't know if you saw that. I, I yeah. think he is the next guy in the lineage of Joey Calcaterra, <laughs> Cam Spencer, and and now Brendan white, Housen. But they will, go out there, they will go out there and get a shooter. They've got a five-star recruit in Amon Noel. Or four and a half star recruit, excuse me, coming in from. Um, he's a point guard. He's a point guard, so you'd think he would, at the very least, kind of be in the same role Castle was, where kind of like, you know, he's out there, maybe not necessarily the floor general, mm -hmm. but he'll be out there. Um, you go out and get a shooter. I think Hassan Diara coming back would be massive. I think yeah, him coming back would be. would be massive again. He does have a year. And again, his brother's still on the coaching <laughs> staff. Like, I don't see any reason why he would transfer. If anything, maybe he'll just kind of move on with his life and, you know, start to... You he, know. Yeah, d it depends. I mean, guys have different priorities, but he's a guy that's like, obviously, he has no NBA prospects. So what yeah. he's going to do is 
he he'll go overseas. He's good enough to play overseas for as long as he wants. But I feel like the one extra year of NIL on the biggest college basketball program currently in the country probably is even more financially viable than whatever he's going to make on a year to year basis for FC Fenerbahce or wherever the fuck he goes. So (laughs) I, I would I would hope he comes back. You'd think so. And then the big question is, you know, UConn brought in five freshmen this year and people don't know that because only one of them played <laughs> yeah well one and a half yeah and when stefan castle was hurt solomon ball got a lot of run and he looked very good r- he looked uh, very good to me i i uh, thought you i don't think, think he looked good i'm not I, like, i'm talking for a freshman i'm not saying oh, for he would a freshman, have been great sure. for freshmen yeah. sure do I, do I think he like i'm confident that he could be in the rotation yeah next year and Agreed. same thing with jalen stewart who have you seen his dad on Twitter? His dad is electric on Twitter. I have, his dad, yeah. <clears throat> and like someone said, like, oh, he needs to transfer down. Like he can't play in the Big East. And his dad just said, like, haha, yeah, right. <clears throat> so that would imply that he had some you know, real <clears throat> moments this year. Like Stewart did for sure have some highlight plays throughout the season. What was so it? It was the Marquette game in the championship, right? Where he hit yes. like two threes. And yeah. to, to see that kind of from the last man in the rotation is huge. And obviously, again, he's got decent height, six foot seven as a wing. I also forgot to mention they have a second recruit, Isaac Abraham. I think I yes. got ahead. Isaiah uh, he's Abraham. A six foot seven wing, a 4.2 star recruit, could very well be involved as well. And then it's just a matter of what do Jaden Ross and Yusuf Singar have. Mm. I mean, Yusuf Singar is seven feet tall. Like, and runs Hurley's the floor not, well. Hurley is not going to bring him in. And again, we saw him only a little bit when Klingon was hurt, and he looked very overmatched, as yes. you would expect. It's hard to develop a big. Even look at Klingon. Klingon only played, like, what, 18 minutes a game last year as yeah. a freshman, and he's going to be a lottery pick. Like, bigs take a while to develop, even, even good ones, so... Look at Zach Eady. Look at Zach Eady, for example. Yeah, it took him t- until his junior year to really kind of uh, it's a kind of uh, show out here. So, so um, God, sorry, lost my train of thought there. But we'll see what those two can do. I hope they stay. Jaden Ross again. He's six foot eight. He's got good size. He's more of a guard. He's more of a big guard as mm. opposed to like a, a four. It may be like a stretch four, but I hope he stays, and we'll see what he does. Um. And I hope Singar stays, but I wouldn't be surprised if UConn goes out there and looks for a big guy yeah. and, and goes out there and looks for a big guy. Because like I said, I don't think Johnson is truly a starting five, even though it's, he's at 6'10". Yeah. I just don't think he, he can't shoot at all. Like Klingon could shoot a little bit. Johnson is a floor space killer. Like you cannot put him out there. Notice him and Klingon did not play at all together this year because you can't yeah. have two non-shooters out there and he's such a non-shooter again i think he could have a huge role but i don't see him as like the guy and i doubt singar is gonna be the guy either <laughs> and i gotta i gotta shout out the one last guy here on this roster apostolis rumaglu <laughs> a two-time champion the boy as much as i love him he has won two national championships go and play if he transferred down to, say, Central, he would mm-hmm. play. He mm-hmm. would play a lot. Like, I think he would start on a low, on a lower-level D1 team. The question is, what does he want? Does he want to go do that, or does he want to stay at UConn and play a lot? Like, look at Richie Springs, for example. He went and played a ton at Quinnipiac this year, which yeah. he deserves for what, you know, what he went through. Even though he's the back of the, you know, the last scholarship guy, he can go and play Division One basketball. And I think he should. I think he. I think he should stay in Connecticut. New Britain's beautiful. Yeah. Well, compared to stores, New Britain's like New York City. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I he's a guy that you know we we have not seen him play any sort of meaningful basketball over the last couple of years. But because UConn blows teams out so much, we have seen him play basketball. And Pat, he's shown more flashes than Richie Springs ever did. I mean, I'll say oh, one thing. Shoot. One thing about Rumaglu, he comes in in these garbage time moments, and when, when normally when you see guys in that role. They come in and they brick shit because they're cold as shit and they're just bad. He might, he could be a nine, ten minute a game player, I think, if we construct the roster a certain way. So I don't think playing time's out of the question for him. It's definitely going to be a a question mark, but he could, yeah, you're right. I think he he could could go go and play 35 minutes in the America East or the NEC. Absolutely. I think he could do that. And again, 
it's again we we don't know but he's also six eight like he's a big guy like yeah, he's got he looks he's the got, part he's got great size um because what uh, you're you're in hassan the other yes. the other international he transferred to i believe eastern illinois i don't mm. know how much he played i don't think he played a ton but i mean i think ruma has got more game than he does yes Brand, brandon's I looking it up <clears throat> i am and the other guy that transferred remember Rasul southern Diggins? indiana Southern Indiana. I, I do close. remember Rasul Diggins. Yes, he he had a huge leap at UMass this year. Like I think he averaged like eleven points a game. Really uh, good like for him. He, I remember thinking he, he was the future at one point, and that because well, it was him, well. Hawkins, and um and Johnson were these yeah. th- those three big top one hundred guys they brought in, and he never played. And he transferred out. Didn't do much last year as a as a as a sophomore. He played a lot, so good for him. Like you know, as much as you want these kids to work out, go play. I mean, I don't think Rumaglu ever went there thinking like I'm gonna play a lot, but like, yeah, go play. But like, Ray Hassan got... played four and a half minutes a game, by the way, and only got it. Th- that's six what I'm saying. This year, but so. I think Rumaglu, <laughs> I think Rumaglu's got a lot more game yeah, than agreed. than than Hassan. But it's just gonna be a matter of because like there's gonna be well one they have an open scholarship. They only had twelve. Mm. So they only carry twelve scholarships this year. So inherently they've got one. Castle and and um both Castle and Klingon are gone. I don't mm. want to hear otherwise. They're going. No, and then not. Newton and Spencer are gone yep. as well. And as of right now, Dr. is he he's graduated. He's you know he can do as we please. So at the very least, they've got five potential scholarships to fill. Let alone the po- I think you know I think I hope there's no trade. I don't even want to say that I expect one transfer because I'm afraid if it is, I'm afraid it's going to be Solomon Ball. So like <clears throat> I don't. I don't want that to happen. To me, at at this point, the way I've seen Hurley construct teams is if anyone's going to transfer, it's because he believes he's bringing in someone better. Because I don't think, I don't think if he promised Solomon Ball a starting job or a six man, eh, maybe six man he would leave. But if he Solomon Ball right now, I think is in line for a starting job, and I don't think he leaves if that's the case. And if he does, it's because whoever we bring in, it's because we think you know Ahmad Noel is going to be an instant impact guy and he's going to start in the backcourt with DR or whatever it may be just because I remember you remember Corey Floyd the boy uh I remember when he left I was like what I was like why are you leaving why are you leaving you are in line for more guard minutes next year I th- I want to say he left like right after Gaffney left and I was like what you were well, going to play what are you doing well because he redshirted and, he he was one of yeah, those situations he where he came in he came came in early in the yeah. second half of the year and then he just left and went to Providence, yeah, I, which I, I believe his father played at Providence. He, he did, so it made sense. He did not I, play. I, he's you know he's kind of one of those just like rotational pieces, just yeah. like a guy that's out there. So that, like, but that that's my point is like I remember being like, oh, Corey Floyd's a guy that you know we were really high on coming into when he got recruited, and now he's in line for minutes, and then he transfers, and we're like, why? And you see what he's ended up doing at Providence, and you're like, that's why Hurley knew what he was and yeah. knew he wasn't anything special so he recruited other guys to play over him and then Floyd anyway. left so exactly. that is what it is you know if we get a transfer to it's fine at this point Hurley has earned every single benefit of the doubt on the planet and I'm just very excited for and they're losing the come. goat undefeated Andrew Hurley Andrew Hurley and four, and yeah, you know I think, what we I think it's do? 43 I think it's 43 now oh, sh- I just thought of this though obviously we're not going to have time today we still got a good amount of stuff to talk about today I know but 40 minutes of UConn. We got to do a off. random UConn player draft. Oh, <laughs> one we of can these do days. that for sure. Not yeah. today, but one of these days from like, we'll, we'll cap it at a certain, you know, maybe yeah. in the last like 15 years. And yeah. oh, I think we could just absolutely. Oh, baby. That would be disgusting. Get, get me some Rakeem Lubin up in this bitch. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Doug All right, Wiggins. You, oh, God. All right. Yeah. UConn basketball uh, is great. We're very excited. Uh, I did not think we'd ever be at this point back on top of the world. I mean, I said that last year as well. Uh, Just, you know, living all those years in the American and my entire attendance at UConn was a four-year stretch where we only made the tournament one time. To be back at this point, um, thank you, Dan Hurley. Thank you, David Benedict as well, getting us back into the fucking Big East because, God, we needed that. And uh, here's to the three-peat. Let's go get it. So, Like I said... I, I said after the game, because like inherently you want to say, I don't believe it, but I said, I believe it. Yeah, like, I don't, no, really. I don't, last year when they won, I'm like, wow, I can't believe they did it. But this year I was just like, okay. Like, yeah, yeah. they won. They won. That's that's yeah. incredible. That's just, to be that stress-free, that game was like the only game I've been stressed all year. Yeah. Incredible. Agreed. Incredible. Agreed. And uh, we can move on here, Pat. Look, every year... 
it is a, a it is an annoyance for me personally because WrestleMania and the, the Final Four are always the same weekend. I always have to balance that. Last two years now, I've had to watch the uh, the Final Four game to get into the championship game. I've had to watch the Final Four game during night one of WrestleMania. And you've but, got a pull in there too. You could you could get to that those games, couldn't you? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, but hey. Look, it is what it is. WrestleMania was awesome. So just to recap my experience a little bit, um, shout out to anybody that, you know, came up to me and took a picture of me. I think I met 20 to 25 people and took pictures oh, with them cool. throughout the course of that weekend, which was crazy. Um, most of it was at, they have like this fan fest called WWE World. And I went there Did on Thursday. The uh, I did not plug the pod, what but the I went there and that was probably where like 12 of the pictures happened. And otherwise they were just kind of spread out over the next few days. So that was awesome. Anybody who came up to me, thank you. It was great to meet you guys. And to anyone else listening, uh, if you happen to see me in person ever, yeah, come up and say hi. Cause I love meeting you guys. It was and if awesome. you happen to see me in public, throw tomatoes at me, <laughs> <laughs> if you go buy tomatoes and then throw them at Pat, um, just for WrestleMania itself. Saturday was fucking cold. It was outside at Lincoln Financial Field at the Eagles Stadium, and it got cold as shit. Sunday, much less cold, so that, that was very nice. And uh, look, wrestling on the whole, um, I, I just want to say this. Look, the, the weekend was headlined by Roman Reigns finally getting dethroned after a 1,300-plus day title reign. The man won the championship during COVID, had the thing for damn near four years. Um I, that kind of thing just doesn't generally happen in the modern day. So that was that was very cool kind of, you know, to see that moment finally transpire. The changing of the guard, changing of the championship, going to Cody Rhodes. It was very cool. A little overdue, but very cool. And it was in an insane match that featured cameos from The Rock, John Cena, The Undertaker. Uh, if you are even even a quarter of a wrestling fan go do yourself a favor and watch that match or at least the second half of it because it was it was crazy and that all leads me into this just a, a mini rant mini monologue here is that wwe is a lot of fun right now um i have been watching this product for my entire life basically i think i i, I had a brief period in like early high school where i stopped watching because look i think every everybody who grows up or everybody who's a wrestling fan as a kid you know, you find out it's fake and you, you either stop watching or you watch it with kind of a new appreciation. And it took me a, a little bit to adjust to that sort of, OK, I know it's fake, but now I don't really care and I just can watch it for what it is. Um, I recommend that anybody who has any sort of interest in wrestling or anybody who wants to maybe give it a try. Now's the time. And I've never plugged it in this way before because wrestling, quite frankly, can be an embarrassing thing if you're not familiar with it. Um, it, it there is a level of quote unquote fakeness to it. Yes, it's scripted. Yes, it's guys, you know, again, quote unquote, pretending to fight. But look, Vince McMahon is gone. He's the guy who pioneered the entire company, built it into what it is. Uh, turns out, and this is not shocking to me, he is a sexual deviant and because of that has been pushed out of his own company i know pat you're you're shocked that this he's what this billionaire old man is a his a wife piece was of almost shit. our his almost his wife was almost our senator i that is true too linda mcmahon in connecticut um but yeah vince mcmahon and if you followed the wwe at all and seen some of the storylines that he pioneered in there as well um this is not a surprise but yes he's a piece of shit he's completely gone and because of that the company is in a completely new direction uh, Triple H, for those of you that know that name, he's in charge of all the creative now. He writes everything. He oversees all of that. And everything, it's so different from even just a year ago. Like, the storylines, they make sense. They're fun. They're engaging. The camera work has changed. The production has changed. And, like, I've I've weeded it out of me a long time ago about the the predetermined nature of the matches being embarrassed. Like, I don't care if people know I watch wrestling because of that. What I cared about was if they walked in and on me watching it and there was some stupid fucking storyline that was just cringe and whatever, and that's what I was watching at the time because I had to sit through it. Those don't exist anymore. The, the cringe has been weeded out in that regard. And, uh, you know, if, if you're open to it, I just recommend it. This is the hottest time for wrestling since the late 90s when, you know, Stone Cold and The Rock were at the peak of their powers. And I don't think... I don't think we'll ever fully get back to that point because back then there was so much less, you know, media in general. There was no Netflix. There was no, you couldn't just pull up what you wanted whenever you wanted. So I don't think it'll ever be that hot again. But in terms of a quality of the product standpoint, um, 
WWE is really cool right now, and it's a lot of fun, and I actually enjoy watching every week versus, you know, feeling like uh, it's just muscle memory to turn it on and hope that it's good. That's that's what I will say about it. Yeah, that, 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 that's good. That's good. I was uh, I used to be one of those people that was like, that's not real wrestling. Like, <laughs> like just thinking, like, oh, it's just this stupid soap opera. But now at the point, it's just like uh, the, my um, stance on it is just, it's not for me. And yeah, and that's like, fair. I watch I watch NASCAR. That's not for everybody. Like I watch right. golf. That's not for everybody. Masters this week. Put your bets in. Uh, Sahithi Gala, like plus a lot of money. So <laughs> put that one <laughs> okay. in there. But, like, that one it's down. not for me. I will say I've got to bring up one tweet I saw that was hysterical. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not a good tweet. Um, so obviously people were up really high, really far away. Yeah, yeah. And someone tweeted like, "Yo, I'm up here with Benoit," and someone oh, goes, "Brother, oh, you're oh, going the wrong direction." Oh, <laughs> somebody said, somebody quoted it and said, "You're going, <laughs> you're going the wrong way." That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty I, good. I, I saw I'm not that gonna, one. And I'm just like, damn it. Yeah, not gonna I, elaborate on that one for anyone not in the know. But uh, if you are in the know, that is that's pretty good. Yeah, just um, Google Chris Benoit. Don't worry about it. Yeah, don't do it now. Yeah, and and. Yeah, that that's that's all really. Um, wrestling's a lot of fun, and if you can get past the fact that it is a scripted thing, it's uh, it's how they you know execute the script now that makes it a lot of fun. And look, there's a level of realness too that plays out, you know, not necessarily on the screen but behind it. It's like, I there's there's people out there I think that are just like, oh, they can just script anybody to have the title or whatever. Like that's stupid. Yeah, but they don't. Like, they give the title and they give the recognition and they give these main event spots to guys who work their asses off to be smoother in-ring performers, to be better characters, to be better talkers on the mic. Like, it, it's there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. So that that's all. I just say be open to it if you're open to it and uh, give, check it out because right now, right now is the time to check it out. I would not have recommended this to you a year ago or two years ago. Right now is the time if you, if you want to. All right, Pat. 50 minutes into the pod, let's get into some football. football. But look, look, that's that's what the offseason is going to do. There's going to be some times where we talk about other shit before we get into the football. But the biggest piece of football news, again, Stephon Diggs traded to the Texans. Um, a move that I think makes sense from the Texans' perspective. But let's get into the terms of the deal here. So the Texans get Stephon Diggs. Uh, a 2024 sixth round pick and a 2023 fifth rounder. The Bills receive a 2025 second round pick. So the Bills got a 20. <laughs> the Bills got a single second round pick for their number one receiver. Not even this year. Not even this year. And Pat, what this tells me is, man, Diggs really overstayed his welcome mm-hmm. in Buffalo. I mean, we yeah. we heard rumblings for the past couple years, and I mean, some of them came from Diggs himself, just little rumors of him being unhappy and being a diva and all that. And it finally boiled over to where the Bills were like, "Get this guy the fuck out of here. We will eat." you know, $30 million in dead cap this year just to get him out. And now the Texans have him. And some int- an interesting piece of this deal is the Texans wiped out the final three years of Diggs' contract. Diggs had still had four years left on his deal. He now only has this one. And it's essentially turned his contract into a one-year, $22 million deal. The thinking here is it will incentivize Diggs to play well in a contract year. So the Texans, you know, can get the very best out of Stephon Diggs. The Texans... Are, are going for the Super Bowl. That's that's what they're doing at this point. Like sure, this year, yeah. they, they think they can compete for a Super Bowl right now. Um, and look, maybe Diggs is part of their, their future plans for the, the year after this, whatever. But for now, one-year deal, they'll see if he can prove it. And if not, they can get him out. If he does, cool, they've got this great receiver on a Super Bowl contending team. And, uh, you know, they're just not tied to a potential problem, a potential diva long-term. And... I was looking into the the kind of the dollar amounts here as to why this would make sense for Stefan Diggs because I was like, okay, you know, if he's why Stefan Diggs seems to be on the decline. At least if we are to believe the second half of last year, maybe it's entirely scheme based, but there is at least the potential right now that he is on the decline. So why would he want to wipe out the final three years of his deal? And to me, it's because he was originally due to make 18 million in 2025, 19 million in 2026, 17 and a half million in 2027, which would have put him right around. That's basically 18 million dollars a year. Puts him right around 17th in the highest paid wide receivers, uh, near Deontay Johnson and Christian Kirk. And oh dear. you know, I I think there is, at least in Stephon Diggs' mind, and probably in reality, there is a chance that he outperforms that this year. You know, be, it proves that he is still firmly inside the top 12 wide receivers in football, or at least that's the gamble he's taking. Because if he proves that, 
then look, he can go out and get, you know, especially with the, the cap constantly going up, 20 million a year for a couple of years. I think this is a both, this is Stefan Diggs betting on himself and the Texans kind of, you know, playing it safe here to not lock themselves into a guy who, if he's yeah. declining, Fuck it. They don't have to deal with them anymore. But, Pat, what was your reaction to this deal when you saw it come through? And now that you've sat on it a little bit, how do you feel about it? Well, first it? of all, when I read the, the notification, I thought it said Jaguars. And I'm like, what the hell? And then I saw it again, and I was like, what the hell? Like, yep. <clears throat> um, I think he's got – I mean, like, I, there's definitely the threat of a decline. Absolutely. I think he's still got it. I think he's still got it. You look at last year before the bye week. Uh, even before, what did Joe Brady come in? But the first, whatever, nine weeks of the year, this is half PPR scoring. 26, 13, 19, 36, 24, 20, 17, 16, 22. Like, the guy mm-hmm. still clearly has something we're a fantasy podcast. we got to put it into fantasy context. But he was a very, I, I would know, I had him. And his decline was part of the reason why I couldn't make the playoffs. But mm-hmm. he, he, I think he's still got it. And I think, the biggest thing about it was Joe Brady coming in and just running the ball like a lunatic. Yeah. And, but, and I also think it had to do with personal things, you know, with, he seems to always have a riff with Josh Allen and, but for him to get really schemed out for being as talented as he, as he is with a track record that he has, like, I think that's gotta be something beyond the football field. But like mm. you said, there's, there's definitely the, I will, like I said, there is definitely the threat of a decline. So the Texans kind of taking away a little more risk. I think it's brilliant on their part. I think they far and away have the best wide receiver trio in the league. I don't even know who it would have been before. Like there's not really a ton of super strong wide receiver yeah. trios. Plenty of great duos. The first one that popped into my head was Chase Higgins and fucking Tyler Boyd, who did nothing this past year. But like right. they. By far, not even close, now have the best wide receiver trio in the league. And I, I, I think it's a great gamble because not only do you provide C.J. Stroud with um, another weapon, he's a veteran. You know, he can, you know, you know, I don't know, the guy's a diva, the guy's a crackpot, what the enemy holds the knife or whatever that means yeah. <laughs> he is about the wide receiver. But The enemy but, speaks kindly and holds a knife. Yeah, but he can realistically be a mentor to guys like Tank Dell, to guys like Nico Collins. I think, especially for what they gave up, I think it's great for the Texans. I think it's great for the Texans. The Bills, they're looking at Mac Collins and Curtis Samuel as their top two wide receivers on the depth chart yeah. right now. Uh, for a lack of a better word, <clears throat> ew. Ew. Like, ew. what I do, ew. Do. Like, yeah. I mean, they have Dalton Kincaid as well, but surely they're going to draft multiple wide receivers here in the draft. Yeah. What do they pick? I think 23, I think they pick at. Somewhere like they, around that, yeah. They will sure, I think there will be wide receivers in that range. Surely they will get one. But, like you said, they must have been that fed up with him. Sean McDermott, you know... I guess for Sean McDermott, it would probably be like when uh, Osama bin Laden was killed for Al Qaeda. It was probably that difficult for him to for him to do that. You know, I gotta I gotta shoehorn in the Sean McDermott Al Qaeda reference anytime I can. I knew I knew it was coming as soon as you said his name. <laughs> but you gotta think from Sean McDermott's perspective, from Joe Brady's perspective, from Josh Allen's perspective, not worth it. Just not yeah. just not worth it anymore. And to give up a good player like that, to, and to not really have a strong fallback. That said, from a fantasy perspective, whoever the hell they draft in the first round, huge stock. Yeah. You know, we're talking about, like, we've got guys like Marvin Harrison and Roma Dunsey and, um, oh, God, Malik Neighbors. I think whoever they draft could be right up there with them just because of quarterback and yeah. situation. That That is the ideal. Sp- if you're a wide receiver in this draft, that is the ideal spot to go right now is Buffalo. And I think, for, obviously, we don't know who it is. You know, they could take, I don't know, somebody terrible. <clears throat> but um, but I will, obviously, we'll talk more about this in a few weeks after the draft. But I think that could have massive, massive uh, fantasy implications. Where do you rank Josh Allen now heading into the year? Because I think a lot of people went into it, you know, that he would probably be number one or number two. Mm-hmm. And rightfully so. Yeah. Where 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 do you where would you put him right now? This doesn't change a lot for me with Josh Allen. Um, 
You obviously don't love to see a quarterback lose his number one and number two receivers. Fuck you, Gabe Davis. But, I mean, God, Curtis Samuel is probably an upgrade from you at this point. Um, Oh, dear. You don't love to see that, but Josh Allen provides so much value, not just with his ability to run, but his willingness to run. I think you've seen a slight drop off in year in past years from like Lamar Jackson and, you know, to an even higher degree, like a Kyler Murray, like their willingness to run. Josh Allen is like, I'm a fucking run, especially when we get inside the goal line. Like, What's the to me, he's just like a big ogre and just like, <laughs> just, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, he's to me, I, he's still my QB one. I still don't foresee myself having much of him, but I'm like, you know, you, like you said, they're going to draft a receiver. They're going to go into the year with unnamed rookie number one, Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir, and Dalton Kincaid. And with Josh Allen still in his prime, still willing to run as much as he has, it doesn't change anything for me. He he was better last year in the second half when Diggs' production fell off. And obviously, you have to factor in that, you know, Diggs was still out there taking defensive attention for sure. But, yeah. like, it's it's not going to affect his ability to run and that the the value that provides the Mac Hollins erasure is disgusting. That's a Raider legend, right? In fact, Arthur Smith legends. I can't, Mac I can't imagine Mac Hollins is playing over either Samuel or Shakir. Or I didn't know he was he, on the bills until yesterday I, when I was prepping for this. I didn't this know is, he was. This I is Justin Shorter slander. It's Justin Shorter. Season, <laughs> but I, I think at the very least, I would say he's either one or two. I might put mm-hmm. Patrick Mahomes ahead of him just because he's Patrick Mahomes. Does not have the rushing upside, but yeah. it's Patrick Mahomes who got Hollywood Brown and maybe Rashi Rice. But, oh, um, boy, yeah. But, and Travis know. Kelsey, of course. But So, like, I, I think I still might put Mahomes there, but I'm still going to put Allen over guys like Lamar, um, yeah, over, over a guy like Stroud. And speaking of Stroud, good fucking Lord. I mean, yeah, he the weapons, has man. three... It's like a fantasy team in itself. And Dal- uh, Dalton Schultz as well. Um, Joe Mixon is going to greatly improve that running game where they had to give Devin Singletary 25 carries a game uh-huh. last year. As much as you know, we've kind of talked about Joe Mixon, us not being huge on him, that will be an upgrade. And yes. the better the offense is, the more likely, you know, even if it's with the running game, it's just going to be a better offense all around. Like, yeah. Uh, and I think Stroud is, unless I'm forgetting someone like, QB4, QB5 for me. Like, I, I don't know. Like, it's hard because you got to think about a guy like Anthony Richardson is, is mm-hmm. well up there. I might be forgetting some people. Because well, the three, you names, gotta, that, you, the three names that popped into my head, obviously, Mahomes, Allen, and Lamar Jackson. You've the got a healthy like, Burrow. That'll be interesting yeah. where he falls in there. Um, the one you're forgetting is Jalen Hurts. That would be the big one as far as fantasy is concerned. Yeah, I'd still put it. Hurts' is rushing upside does. Yeah, so... I'd say right now, I think Stroud peaks at QB5, but I also think Anthony Richardson is going to, you know, have hu- have huge value up there. I'm not even considering a guy like Justin Herbert uh, to to Me be drafted either, over uh, C.J. Stroud right now. Yeah. I'd probably take Stroud over Joe Burrow right now. Um, yep. But just massive, massive. But uh, the wide receivers, the wide receivers, that is tough. Boy. Right now, if I need to draft a Texans wide receiver, I am drafting Tank Dell. Just because there was a clear connection there with C.J. Stroud. Yeah. Uh, in, in his ability with the deep ball, and we've seen Nico Collins not struggle with injuries for years now, which is really kind of... He had a good year last year, don't get me wrong, but like truly break out. He, that's been his inability to do that. But I would probably rank it Dell, Diggs... Collins if I had to rank those three wide receivers it's so hard for me because I feel like you look at the wide receiver personnel and logic to me dictates that Tank will play the least out of them not that he's not going to play a lot he's going to play a fuck ton but like sure I don't see Diggs or Collins coming off the field a whole lot I agree with you in that the the Stroud tank connection was stronger than any other connection Stroud showed. I mean, look, he's connecting with Nico Collins quite a bit as well, but the 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 tank connection was something special there. I 
God, I don't know. I need to see where their ADPs fall once we start to get into real draft season to of figure course. out. Because I because I think who I like the best is going to be whoever's ranked the lowest. I really do. Like, it's just I, these I think are, it's going to be Collins. These are these are three guys that I feel like the Texans coaching staff and Bobby Slowick are going to draw plays for almost indiscriminately. It's not going to be. Stefan Diggs is the guy that we draw up the first read plays for, you know, exactly. way more than these other two. It's going to be a more even distribution, at least by season's end. I'm sure there will be certain weeks where, you know, they'll identify a matchup and be like, all right, Tank, we're going to give you a shit ton this week. So it's tough for me in that sense. I, I think if there's anybody out there that thinks Diggs is coming in here to immediately be the clear cut number one more than the other guys target getter. I think you're mistaken there. Yes. He's getting paid $22 million. To me, this is a matter of let's get CJ all the weapons we can and let's let him go to work with just this complete array of weapons that he has. And uh, that doesn't necessarily give way to one guy being a clear, better fantasy option than the others. So it's going to be tough. I think it definitely makes it less clear from a fantasy perspective of which of these guys I would want. Cause before I was like, look, get me Nico or get me tank. I don't care. I want at least one of them. Like it would be, they're both great bets. Now, now I don't know. Cause there's going to be weeks where Nico Collins is, you know, three catches for 40 yards and Diggs is going for a hundred and two touchdowns. And yeah, tank Dell's got predict. tank Dell's got three catches, but they're for 95 yards. Cause that's what he does. It, they are, it's a great situation for real life. It's very, very tough. The one thing I will say that Diggs has shown great durability. I don't believe he's had like a long-term injury as opposed to yeah. Collins, who's missed a lot of games. And Dell obviously had that uh, an unfortunate injury. Obviously, as a rookie year, you Ugh. can't label someone. You can't yeah. label something as that, but especially on a play like that, at least you very much know that Diggs is going to be on the field. Knock on wood. I don't. I don't want to jinx the guy. I maybe I'm the enemy, smiling, holding the knife or whatever, the, or whatever the fuck. But <laughs> stab, stab. It, at least we know that he'll he'll be out there, and I yeah. I don't think he's washed. I I think he might be trending that way, but I think he's towards the top of the decline. I'll say he's entering such a different situation too. Like yeah. not like CJ. CJ can move. But CJ is not going to be the runner that Josh Allen is, obviously. Um, there's going to be a lot of passes to go around. And Diggs is finally playing with guys who are, I would say, actual threats to take defensive attention. I mean, look, you got to worry about Gabe Davis going over the top of you, you, you. So that is a threat in itself. And obviously they brought in Dalton Kincaid. But I think this cast of weapons should leave Diggs a little more room to operate than he's used is to. Is he going to be unhappy? He was unhappy in Minnesota when Adam Thielen was taking targets from, and now obviously he wasn't happy in Buffalo. Is he going to be happy here? Like, is is this guy just straight up a diva? Is my is my question? Yeah, I I think he's got to know the situation he's stepping into, right? Like, he's got to know that they're going to be winning a lot of football games, like, yeah, and especially in a division that is very up for grabs. So yeah. Like, it, it's going to be interesting because with it being a, you know, a contract year for Diggs, is there going to come a point where he's like, oh, they're, they're sabotaging me. They just don't want me to get paid, whatever. Like, they're trying to get a discount for themselves to re-sign me. I mean, I guess if that was the logic, then he just would say, fuck Houston. I, if they were doing that to me, he would go anywhere, go, go somewhere else anyway. But, I, yeah, I don't know. Look, there's always the chance that he ends up just being a diva and, and working his way out of here. But I'll say this. He's been a more... He's been a more subtle diva than like an Antonio Brown type where it's like ripping your shirt off and leaving the field. Like I think if there's any sort of dissension, it, oh, oh, we, of won't, we won't really see it um, and it'll come out after the fact. But yeah, yeah it's going to be an interesting storyline to watch for sure because I, I, I don't know. I think the Texans made a good move to get CJ as many weapons as possible, but it's like definitely proceed with caution here with the type of personality that Stefan Diggs is. But Texans, uh, save us. From Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, please. You are currently our thought, best hope, I think. <laughs> this time last year, before they even the draft, that we would be saying, the oh, Texans, man. you are our I biggest know. hope in the AFC. What yeah. the fuck? <laughs> no, seriously. Like, I mean, who else are we really leaning on here? I guess uh, if the Jets are, if Aaron Rodgers is healthy, we could look toward the Jets. And if I get the Ravens, I guess the Ravens are the, certainly the big one. Um, I and a healthy say, Bengals team. Aaron Rodgers absolutely looked at the sun without glasses. He wasn't going to wear those oh, woke liberal yeah. glasses. I mean, no. to be fair, so did I. But I'm also just a dumbass. <laughs> like, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm just a dumbass. I did it to be funny at work. But, but, That's fair. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, he he he's true. I think Baltimore's still the biggest threat, even over Houston. But Houston's just a lot younger, a lot more fun, and I think just inherently more rootable than yeah. than it seemed like Baltimore. But like you said, Cincinnati, the, I, I will never believe the Jets will be contenders until I see it. Until, That's but fair. it, it could very fair. well happen though. Like I think it's you know completely within the realm of possibility for them to be contenders in the AFC. But but yeah, uh, wild, uh, just a wild, a wild trade. Um, and I think the Texans are absolutely the favorites to win the AFC South. Oh yeah, they they got to be. But in the AFC South, Pat, also you've got. The Jags making a move here. Josh Allen agrees to a five-year, $150 million contract, including $88 million guaranteed. He was originally franchise tagged. Um, Not much to analyze here other than good on the Jags for getting this deal done. Your defensive anchor, you know, you don't have to have him be pissed off all year on the franchise tag. So good move on their part. Um, And then the other piece of news coming out today, Pat, Packers will play the Eagles in Brazil week one to kick off the season Friday night. Actually, wait, is there a Thursday night game to open the year? There probably is, right? There's a Thursday night game. So Friday night football will be the second game to open up the year. Uh, Time zone wise, because I was curious about how Brazil stacked up to, you know, here, uh, that time zone will be one hour ahead of Eastern Standard Time. So nothing crazy like London, obviously. Um, So that's what we'll be looking at time wise. It'll be pretty normal, pretty negligible. There's going to be football games on six days this year because they're, the NFL has said that there will be games on Christmas Day, which is yep. a Wednesday. <laughs> so mm-hmm. I think Tuesday right now is the only day. And who knows? 2020 it happened because of all the, the COVID nonsense. They yeah. played. There were games played on every day of the week. But hey, yeah. football. I don't give a hey, shit. I love football. I, know. I, I will watch football every day. I'm looking Except forward to it. Except the UFL. Except, Perfect, except the UFL. That was not intentional. Perfect transition. I just yeah. whacked my microphone. That 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 transitions as well. Uh, it's something I want to touch on because I do get people a good amount, you know, asking me about the UFL and what do I think and will I make content about it. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, look, unless something drastic changes, unless there's some wild storyline that comes, like this Jake Bates. is. Yeah, I mean, that field goal was wild. Um, This is simply a time of year where I enjoy not following just every single possible league of football that I can't like. That's just not what's in me to do. I enjoy the NFL. I care about the NFL, the lead up to the draft and eventually, you know, watching and I'm going to be live streaming during the NFL draft. That's what I'm focused on right now. Um, I don't care about just every form of football and maybe that's just me from what i from what i can tell the ufl is putting out a pretty good product people seem to like it it seems to be working out well but i'm not watching the ufl for the same reason that i didn't used to watch the cfl or the afl or whatever AAF. afl the aaf whatever fl was going on during the nfl offseason shut up i'm not (laughs) addicted to just the sport itself you know at all times this is a nice downtime to make me psyched for when the nfl comes back see like i just flat out kind of only like the nfl like i'm not like i'm with you football 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 i like college football i used to really like college football now i I like college football i kind of just like i'll have it on i i don't usually like tune in specifically for a college football game the way i do other sports but i just don't care like yeah like I, I, i just flat out I just find out don't care. Like, uh, I'm glad people enjoy it. Um, Jake Bates is going to be an NFL kicker this year. <clears throat> um, Mike Nolan said that teams are already tampering with him, and it's like, Mike Nolan is still alive? Like, does he wear suits and ties while he's on the sideline there too? Or I, I, I don't know. What a, what a tool. But that 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 that's neither here nor there. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, look, maybe it's because, like, I'm – I follow college football vaguely because, I mean, look, it's the next generation of guys who are going to come to the NFL. And maybe if you're a big college guy, that makes you care a little more about the UFL because the UFL is it's kind of a separate version of the same thing, right? You're scouting for guys that could maybe end up in the NFL again. Sure. Like currently, currently, it's a bunch of either washouts or they never got a real chance anyway. But look, if you want to tune into the UFL and monitor the progress of Matt Corral, be my guest. I'm just not. Yeah, that's me. right. I, I'm going to be continuing to just monitor what's going on in the NFL. And after the draft, you know, when things do start to quiet down, um, I'll just be thinking about probably fantasy football stuff because Watch that's some when... baseball kids. Like, don't like... I, you know, 
if the pitchers weren't all ripping their fucking elbows apart, oh, then maybe I'd consider it. But yeah, it, it's it's kind of NFL or die when it comes to football for me. So no, the UFL seems fine, but just not for me. Uh, Pat, let's actually, before we go to the viewer questions, I guess we should talk about our fantasy football draft order because that's not a viewer question. It's just at the bottom of our show sheet. Yeah. Um, okay, so we determined our fantasy football draft order and we will now know it for how many months? Four and a half months before the, our fantasy football draft, essentially. Um, Pat, where did you finish? You Third? Was it second. third? Second. Second, okay. So Pat ended up with the second priority in our fantasy football draft order. The way we do it is wherever you finish in whatever competition we do, you get that priority to pick your draft pick. Um, so assuming the person who finished first takes number one, Pat, I'm guessing you'll be taking number two. Do you want number no, two? No kidding, yes. <clears throat> yes, yes so you'll do. be taking number and- two. I'll be taking a number two right after this as well. But uh, <laughs> but um, I, I got to preface this, this. We've done some wild shit in the past. We have. One year, we hid plastic Easter eggs around a BJ's and did an that Easter egg hunt. Good. I was that awful was at good. it. I came in dead last. I only beat the person that didn't show up. Thank you, Finn. Um, <laughs> uh, our, our listener, B-Dags, and I found the last one at the same time, and I'm like, just fucking take it. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like just take it. I don't care. <laughs> Like, but we've done last. the Iditarod. We've done the Spelling Bee twice. Spelling we Bee did. Fun. Remember in 2020, the NBA 2K tournament during COVID? The, we did that. I was. Did I ever? Root. Did I ever reveal the secret about the NBA 2K tournament? No. I could have, could have cheated during that. I chose not to. How could you have cheated? It wasn't live. It was all in oh, our little ESPN media bank, and I oh. worked there, and I saw the recordings so I. in there. I, yeah, but I knew I was working with that database every day, and I saw the unaired, I, and it was before we filled out our brackets. I didn't do it. I ended up finishing fourth or, like, sixth or something. Oh, that, but wow. like, I remember, noble, I remember seeing it and being like, oh could do it here but i was like that's terrible karma i won't do that but yes we did we did do a nba 2k tournament bracket because it was nba players playing 2k on espn because there was nothing fucking else going on so they were desperately trying to fill time but yeah we've uh we've come up with some really good stuff in the past um and now pat sits here with the second priority i sit here with seventh so i'm gonna be picking somewhere you know right in the middle i looked at early rankings and it's a good um, spot i think it's look over over the years, especially in a twelve teamer. I've started to really enjoy kind of the middle of the draft. It the only downside is that it makes it a little harder to like fully plan what you want to do because you're kind of just at the mercy of the picks before you, which is the case for any draft pick. But when sure. you're when you when you pick it like. 12 and you have the 12 13 back to back you can look at the guys who are ranked 18th 19th and be like okay if i want both of those guys i could probably get i knew exactly who i was taking at 12 and 13 exactly and i got so you know sitting here it's like i can probably gauge who i want in the first round but after that it's i'm at the mercy of everyone else so i looked and i was like okay seventh assuming i get the seventh pick um Amon Ross St. Brown like there's gonna be good guys here and uh i did i will say one thing we Another member of our league, Gary, texted me, and it was uh, it was a meme about like, what's your favorite position to draft in fantasy football? And someone just goes, IR. And I, Gary goes, I was trying to think of who in our league this was, and I was like, I think it's turning into me because last yeah. year <laughs> I picked Chubb in the first round. Year before I picked Javante Williams in the second round. Both of them went about two weeks before tearing their shit, and I'm <laughs> like, all right, whoever I take in the first round this year. Maybe no one else draft them because they're probably going to tear some shit up pretty early on. In so like, Amon Ross St. Brown might be headed for an injury. Sorry. In at number two, um, assuming the guy in front of me takes the first pick, Sergeant Suma. I don't know if he's a sergeant or not. He is overseas at the moment. I cannot list his uh, – I don't even know where the fuck he is, but I can't li- – <clears throat> but- Zimbabwe maybe. I don't know. Who knows? But he um, – he, assuming he takes the number one pick and assuming he takes Christian McCaffrey – and we need to say again, our league is half PPR this mm-hmm. year, which yeah, changes finally. everything. It does change um, everything. But I will say, before I looked at any rankings, the first name that popped into my head was B. John Robinson. Mm-hmm. Um, As it should. And even after looking and saw like the wide receivers ahead, I was like, okay. But at least from a running back perspective, and besides Christian McCaffrey, I don't know if there's anybody I would take over Bijan Robinson. I think no. right now the only other guy right now that I would take over Bijan at two is C D Lamb. Is, is okay. I think he would be the only yeah. guy. I would take C D Lamb over Tyreek Hill. 
Um, I would take him over Justin Jefferson just because of the quarterback situation. If Kirk Cousins was still in Minnesota, I'd be taking Justin Jefferson, no questions asked. But so yeah, obviously we have so much fucking. What is it? We've got we got four and a half months. months. Oh yeah, four months. Yeah, yeah. until our draft. Yeah. So so much can change. So much can change. But right when I found that I got to. I told one of my friends, and they said, oh, who, who are you going to take? And the first name that came out of my mouth was B. John Robinson. I will say early rankings suggest that a guy like Justin Jefferson might very well be available to me, and I'm just like, man, I don't think I care that Sam Darnold's his quarterback. Oh, it's like, seven. At, it's seven. I won't give a shit either. Oh, he's, at, he's, two, at two, I think you got to give a shit about that. Yeah, no, Mike, Mike Clay's early rankings, he has Jefferson as wide receiver five, let alone where he falls overall. Lamb, uh, Hill, Chase? Chase and St. Brown. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Which PPR okay. with the quarterback situation, I start to and understand Burrow, it a little. And with Burrow being um, back for Chase. You, yeah. you could certainly argue it, but I mean, yeah, it's 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 gonna be interesting how things fall when we get a little closer. But yeah, our draft our draft spots are determined, and so we'll be able to kind of talk from that needless perspective. To say, you know, once needless we get to, to that say point. if I fall into the first pick because because Zuma goes rogue, I'm taking Christian McCaffrey. Uh, yeah, I'll do what Sal did. I'll pick him right now. <laughs> like yeah, exactly. I put, put Suma on the clock at number two or whoever the fuck is at yeah. number two. I think that's fair. All right, we'll finish out with some viewer questions that have been marinating hey! here for I think a month. Finally, all right. We people- just got a letter. We just got a letter. We just got a letter. Wonder who it's from. What'd you say? You started to say, "Can you believe something?" Can you believe it? Cut you off. Viewer questions. I know. I know. We're finally here. We finally got a good, you know, ten minutes or or less to talk about it. Okay. First question: How the fuck do we make running back rankings this year with the league playing musical chairs? It's a good question. Um, there have been a lot of fantasy relevant big name running backs moving around. Not necessarily, you know, tippy top of the draft guys outside of Saquon Barkley, but it's it's gonna be tricky there's going to be some projecting that you have to do and it's going to be a matter of you know how safe do you feel drafting a guy in a new situation um especially with most of them being guys who are past their prime to some extent i think the most interesting debate is going to be derrick henry and i think there's going to be some (laughs) very strong camps on both sides because you've got on one hand you know, he's been falling off a little bit the past couple of years. I mean, last year he finished as what? RB, like he was still a top 12 running back. He was but, still he, an but the RB problem one. was so inconsistent. He was Yeah, he was very inconsistent. He kind of volumed his way there. Now, yeah. you know, he's on a better team. If he's going to volume his way there, he's going to do A team that better. wants to run, but has a running quarterback to take some stuff away. So it's going to be interesting. I think I like him better than I did last year, but oh, I do too. how early... How early of a pick are you going to spend on Derrick Henry? So, yeah, it's it's going to require some projection for sure. I personally, in the in these early rounds at least, like to stick with guys that didn't really change much. I mean, I don't – look, I'm going to be at the seventh pick. I'm going to be at kind of a prime spot to either – like if Saquon's a guy I like, I need to take him there because I'm not going to get him in the second round. Absolutely. Um, I don't foresee myself doing that. I foresee myself taking a guy who's probably on the same team is kind of in a safe situation, which is why I mentioned a name like Amon Ross St. Brown, because he is literally going to be in an identical situation other than, you know, Jamison Williams might be playing a little more this year. And that's what well, you already that's know. It's not, himself, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yeah, so like it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting, um, and it's just a matter of how you want to view things. Because I mean, there's definitely opportunity there for some of these guys that have moved around, like Joe Mixon. Yeah. In, in, in like you said, outside of Saquon and Henry, I don't think any of these other guys that moved may even be RB being drafted as RB ones. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Joe Mixon will. I don't think Austin Eckler will. I don't think Aaron Jones will. I don't think Josh Jacobs. I think Josh Jacobs might, but like even then, like I, I think this movement isn't going to completely shake up the front of the draft. But obviously, no. you know, running backs are huge. You know, run, running backs are a huge deal. So. It will it will make things different, but I guess again it's just weigh things out, see the situation, see the running back, see the trends, are they declining, and then just do what you would normally do. But it's gonna be it's by far the most interesting depth chart yeah. shakeup I can remember in a long time. Oh yeah. I mean, it definitely muddies up the like the just the RB two group because look, I'll I'll just go off of Mike Clay's rankings for now because I have them up. Uh, he actually does have Joe Mixon for now as an RB one in twelve team leagues. He has him literally as RB twelve. Uh, but we know, know knowing that Houston knowing that Houston wants to bring somebody else in that'll probably change on his rankings and consensus. Yeah, Damian Pierce. Um, assuming they do that. 
Yeah. Um, but like, then you look at, you know, further down or past Joe Mixon, you've got, then you've got Derrick Henry. Then you've got Rashad White, who again, Tampa still hasn't brought anybody else in. Then you've got Josh Jacobs. You got Chase Edmonds. Shut up. You got Josh <laughs> Jacobs in Green Bay with them bringing AJ Dillon back only. So that's not really much. Um, then you got Kenneth Walker, you know, returning to his team, but with a new coaching staff. Devon Achan, the ultimate wild card of the draft, in my opinion, for running backs at least. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson, like the RB2s. Naturally, if you're a fantasy RB2 and you're ranked that way, there's some uncertainty. If there was more certainty, you'd be an RB1 most likely. But I think it's. There's so much uncertainty about their potential workloads because of coaching staff changes and team changes um, that there's there's going to be some massive upside to be had here. It's just a matter of if you push the right buttons because these are these are good players, Pat. Like Josh Jacob, Josh Jacobs as RB fifteen. Would you be surprised in Green Bay on that offense if he ended up finishing as a top five running back? Because I wouldn't. Oh, I, wouldn't I mean, be, I wouldn't be shocked in the slightest. No, and, and I mean a guy like you know. Devon Achan would have to hit his kind of ceiling outcome, but like if he stays healthy, he's got that chance as well. Like I it's agree. just it's it is there is a lot of potential there for sure, and it's going. Where's to make my boy for, Isaiah Pacheco on those rankings? Uh, Pacheco is RB eight, so he's oh, he's okay. up there. Oh, so yeah, he's, he's, he's get, yeah he's getting the respect. He's getting the respect. He's definitely getting the respect. All right, with our next question, also on the topic of running backs, of the struggling running backs, Jacobs, Jones, Aaron Jones, Austin, and Austin Eckler. Who will bounce sorry, back who? in fantasy this season? Friend of the pod, Austin Eckler. Oh, who will bounce back sorry. in fantasy this season? I think Eckler's going to – I like the spot for Eckler in terms of what his new role is going to be, but I do not think he's ever going to be back to the Austin Eckler that led your team to a fantasy championship. So I'm going to say not him uh, in terms of that. Then you've got Aaron Jones and Josh Jacobs. I think I, Jacobs is in the best spot. He he has to be right. I think like it's he's Jacobs not a, easily of these. A three. great ascending young team. He's got what appears to be the job to himself because AJ Dillon is bad. Bad. <laughs> I'll, I'll just put it that way. Um, so I think he's definitely the best bet to have a a big resurgent season. And then I mean Aaron Jones. I I think you're just gonna see more of the same or like less from Aaron Jones. Like what, what has Aaron Jones been to this point? A guy who can win you a week, but is wildly inconsistent and injured all the time. And now you send him to a team with a much less stable offense overall, because as of right now, it's led by Sam Darnold and you've got a decent running back behind him in Ty Chandler. So I do feel like Kevin O'Connell is more likely to buy into just one running back as opposed to Matt LaFleur, who just could not keep, AJ Dillon on the bench like for whatever yeah. reason they just I think Jones might get some more volume but again I think this is another guy who might be on the decline and a guy that has basically let you down I drafted a lot of Aaron Jones last year and mm -hmm. while he was good a lot of weeks it was a letdown he was a letdown because he couldn't stay healthy and he did not have quite the consistent playing time from where he was being drafted as like a late yeah. first early second round kind of guy yeah, it was it was definitely questionable usage for basically Aaron Jones' entire career in Green Bay. So yeah, if they commit Free to him Aaron as Jones. more, if they commit to him as more of an RB one, there's definitely some uh, untapped upside there. But Josh Jacobs is definitely the best bet of all of those guys. Hence why he is also you know preliminarily ranked much higher than than the rest of those guys. Well, I guess not much higher than Jones. Jones is currently RB nineteen per Mike Clay. Um, Austin Eckler, you got to go all the way down to RB twenty eight, and even that might be a little too high. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it plays out with those guys. And then finally, which player made you fall in or made you love football in the beginning of being a fan of the NFL question from the game day hour. I like this question because I, I don't think we think about this stuff, at least publicly. We don't voice it too often about the early, early days of us being a fan. Um, other than the obvious Tom Brady, I'll say Wes Welker. I think Wes Welker was a guy that it was just, you know, he was so sneaky elect athletic. He, sneaky, sneaky athletic, real gym rat, all that stuff. Um, just super fun to watch him kind of terrorize the middle of the field and then just kind of chug along his stubby little legs for there was that, that like 99 yard touchdown that I still remember to this day. Oh, I remember um, Monday night football. I remember yeah, that. I yeah. had it on my team. <laughs> yeah. Wes Welker was a guy that I remember really latching onto, um, you know, before the second coming of Wes Welker came shortly into my Patriots fandom in the form of Julian Edelman. Who is, I'd then, argue better, but <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, Edelman that's was, not, that's not relevant to what we're talking no, about. No, yeah, exactly. So I think Wes, Wes Welker would be my answer in terms of just not the most obvious one in Tom Brady. And then I'll say the, 
one more. Uh, Asante Samuel, I really liked as well early in, mm. in, in my fandom. Um, I was very fascinated by cornerbacks in general. I thought interceptions were just the most lit thing in the fucking world, and he did those a lot. So I remember I had a username on NFL.com. It was like, we want Samuel. It was just Asante Samuel's name and number. I don't know. Very obsessed with him as a kid as well. So I'll say those two guys. That's a good question. Yeah, well, I guess the the lore of Pat was that I was a Giants fan for quite mm-hmm. a while. Um, so my, my main guy was Tiki Barber. Uh, I loved Tiki Barber. Like, I remember, like, him and Rondé wrote, like, a children's book. And I, I had it, and uh, I don't know why. I don't know why, but I, um, he was just my favorite player uh, growing up. And also, you had a fascination with quarterbacks. I had a fascination with tight ends. Um, if mm. I was wearing pants right now, I would get up and go get my Kevin Boss jersey. I was going to say that Kevin I have in Boss. there. When Kevin Boss, like Kevin Boss catching that, that that's the, the, the forgotten one of that Super Bowl because of obviously David Tyree and then the Burris touchdown. Kevin Boss had a huge catch over the middle that set them up. So, um, and that, that, that still, that Super Bowl is still to this day one of the best nights of my whole life. Um, and it was all thanks to Kevin Boss. And a guy that had gum on his helmet. Fuck that Super Bowl. Fuck Kevin Boss. Fuck David Tyree. Um, now I'm angry, so we can end the podcast. Okay, great questions, guys. Um, Pat, what's our deal next week? Are we here on Tuesday? I think we're going to be here at the same time. Wait, I, I think wait, we're going to be here same time, same place. Same, Wednesday again? Yeah. Or is it? Okay, uh, yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday yeah. for the pod, one more time next week, or at least and for then, now, one more time. Then, and then Monday. <laughs> <laughs> then Monday. And then yes. we'll be back. Um, and one of these episodes as well will be a mock draft episode. Well, it's got to be, so mo- be that Monday, that right? Mind. Yes, that, that, that Monday seems to be the best one um, a couple days before the NFL draft. Yeah, so that's what's coming up for Off the Bench. Um, and, guys, if you enjoy the show, remember, I haven't reminded this in a while, but, you know, rate us, like us on whatever you yeah. listen to us on, whether it's Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, you know, sub to us on YouTube, like us on YouTube, whatever. Any button you can press that supports us, we greatly appreciate it, and it will push the pod uh, to heights never seen before. So thank you guys very much for yeah, listening. Yeah, we appreciate you guys. And uh, once again, go UConn. So for Pat Gustafson, yeah. I'm Brandon Carney, and we'll see you guys next week.